Thank you. Good morning. Very excited to be here today and to present. Um, Wilson Asset Management, just very briefly, it's a boutique fund manager with 25 years history founded by Jeff Wilson and specializing in managing listed investment companies across various strategies, predominantly equities. And um, I'm managing alternative assets portfolio at Wilson Asset Management. Um, disclaimer, as per usual, whatever I say today is for educational purposes only. I'm not allowed to provide financial advice, which I always feel awkward about because I feel like I know enough. Um, VAM Alternative Assets, I always start that it's, uh, it's a truly unique proposition. Unique because the portfolio invests in unlisted assets. So all the underlying investments within the portfolio, they're not listed on SX. They're privately owned assets and businesses. However, the structure of the portfolio is listed. And that's what makes it unique. And when we look at other alternatives listed on ASX, uh, the portfolios have the same level of diversification and exposure to different strategies and asset classes like WMA. And we'll talk through this today. The, the main purpose for me is really not necessarily talk about WMA. I'm, I'm really passionate about alternative assets. I spent over 20 years of my career working in the UK, US, and then Australia, investing on behalf of large institutional investors in alternative asset classes. And I really love bringing that knowledge to our shareholders, bringing that knowledge to the market. I think it's a very interesting area and deserves a lot of attention from investors. So, it's true that alternative assets, it's a very broad definition. Some investors would say alternative assets include private markets, but also hedge funds, liquid credit, and more niche esoteric strategies. For the purpose of today's presentation and for the purpose of talking about WMA portfolio, I will be referring to alternative assets as predominantly private markets investments. So, those are investments in tangible assets and businesses privately owned, as we said, and all of them derive their value from those tangible characteristics of the underlying assets. So we're not including hedge funds, liquid credit, etc. Quick question to make you feel a bit more engaged before lunch. Does anyone know how many stocks are listed on ASX? How many companies? 2,200. 2,200. You're well informed. You're all fund managers here. Um, <coughs> any thoughts or guesses how many private companies are registered, private businesses are registered in Australia? Thousands. So two and a half million as of last year. Huge universe. You know, I'm just saying that it's, it's truly, it's a huge universe. And the difference is enormous between the number of the businesses listed versus privately owned in terms of the volumes, of course, because of the liquidity of listed markets, they do attract more capital. Now, where um, you can invest when you think about alternative assets or private markets, variety of strategies, real estate, and I know you talked today about state strategies. It's not necessarily just residential office assets, retail assets, industrial, healthcare, etc. Some investors include data centers. Infrastructure, any examples of the infrastructure that you can think about? Toll roads, ports, airports, renewable energy, digital infrastructure, social infrastructure, like prisons, schools, they are also infrastructure. Private equity, it's a huge, again, huge universe of um, various strategies and opportunities. 
I'll give you a few examples from the portfolio so you can relate a bit better to, to this strategy. But then again, what I wanted to note here that often you open AFR and you read private equity valuations are collapsing. Now, I always like to specify private equity includes so many strategies across different risk return characteristics. It can be private equity growth opportunity, it can be buyout, special situations, transformation, venture capital. Now, venture capital sits at the top in terms of the risk and return. And yes, it's true, when we see increasing volatility in the financial markets, first it would affect venture capital from private equity um, categories. Why? Because Venture capital investors, they rely a lot on listed markets in order to realize their investments. In order to exit their investments, they use IPO as the exit strategy. And we've seen it over the last two years. There were some amazing stories uh, of success with Australian startups, such as Canva, that attracted a lot of international capital and at some point was valued at about 300 billion company, and the valuation of this company collapsed by about 70% just within the week when IPO window closed. So when you read this news, it's always good to ask those questions, what type of private equity, right? Because not all private equity is the same. Private debt, uh, again, a ex very interesting area. I heard the presentation before that. Um, it was more on the real estate debt strategy. Private debt, very similar, non-bank lending to private businesses. You might see a lot of new strategies uh, in Australia in private credit, in real estate credit. What I would say from educational perspective here, that's the way I view those strategies. Private equity usually has some downside protection because it's backed by businesses or some tangible assets and potentially unlimited upside, you know, potentially. Private debt has limited upside, however, unlimited downside. So very important when you look at the strategies in private debt or real estate debt and they promise you 15% return, please ask tough questions on the risks. Extremely important. And then within real assets, again, the whole range of opportunities. I have a lot of shareholders in WMA portfolio who are farmers, so they love asking questions about agriculture, water rights, etc. cetera. Um, why, when, when I started the presentation, I said I'm really excited to be here today and talking to you about this, and I do, think it's an exciting topic on its own because it's such an interesting area. But it's also really important one, I feel, for you as fund managers of your savings, of your ret retirement um, income. Because if you think from the broader picture, who are your peers? Your peers would be industry funds, super funds. And what do they do? Historically, for decades, they've been investing and allocating more and more capital to private markets, right? So you open any of the annual report of either industry fund or super fund, you will see that on average, they allocate 25 to 30% of their portfolios in private markets. Why they do this? Because those asset classes, those strategies, they strong complementary benefits to any investment portfolio. There are a number of benefits, and I'm not going to go in depth on each of them, and I'll try to give you some examples to explain. But really, when we think about this, it's this very simple concept. Do not put all your eggs in one basket, because every investment within your portfolio ideally should play a slightly different role. And then the end result is long-term sustainable investment returns, because these are your retirement incomes or savings. Um, private markets or alternative assets, they do add diversification benefits. They perform differently throughout economic cycles. They are not necessarily always correlated to listed markets. 
some of the strategies can bring really good inflation protection, such as infrastructure. Some of them really good protection of rising interest rates, like for example, private debt, if it's properly structured. They do have low volatility because they go through different valuation cycles. I like giving example, like one of the investments in WMA portfolio is in Sunshine Coast Airport. Does it value, its value change day to day? It doesn't. It might change every six months, every year. It depends on the number of passengers, depends on other streams of revenues, but its value does not change on a daily basis. So it's a, it's a big difference really within, like between uh, those two asset classes. And then, you know, we talked about this huge opportunity set. There are opportunities and investment strategies that are available in private markets, not necessarily available right now in listed markets, and vice versa. How many of you are familiar with listed investment company? Not too, not too many, so okay. I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time just to explain. So listed investment company, you might think of it as another you know, listed company, listed on SX, underlying assets or underlying portfolio would be investments in different strategies. Um, I believe, well, Marty, my colleague, would know the exact number. As a percentage of the total market, about 10% in Australia, mix, about that. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a very mature structure, has been in place for a long time. When I think about our business, we have about 150,000 shareholders. And some of them, they've been investing with Jeff and the team for a very long time. Why they really like the structure? Because for them, it's really about tax efficient investment returns, uh, dividends are fully franked. Many of our shareholders are also uh, managing their super funds. And from the portfolio management perspective, to me, it's really one of the best structures for the portfolio I manage. And when I think about who are the shareholders, right? Because it provides liquidity to the asset classes that are illiquid. And to some extent, this is also one of the factors why when I looked at the last ATO report on SMSF, and I saw that about 27% of the SMSF portfolios in Australia is allocated to listed equities, about 17% to residential property, some of it in TDs and cash. In other words, there is really no exposure or minimal exposure to this type of asset classes that I'm talking about today. Why? Because they are illiquid. So when I make investments uh, in some of the assets or businesses, I take a long-term view on those investments. I cannot, if I invest in Sunshine Coast Airport today, I cannot go and trade out of it tomorrow. And I can do this as an institutional investor within this structure, but I know that many of my shareholders, they cannot take this long investment horizon. On top of that, there are certain complexities with those strategies, but also large minimum ticket sizes. So investments that I make, they usually start from $5 million plus per investments, and I have 129 assets in the portfolio. Um, it also gives an opportunity to a portfolio manager to be less reactive to inflows and outflows. So if you look at some other structures and the market is being challenged by liquidity event or volatility, you do see inevitably outflows if it's a trust structure or you see inflows. It does take then the adjustment for the portfolio manager to think how to allocate or when to allocate those funds. Close then structure within the leak does give this certainty on the capital base and does give this benefit of taking longer term view. So 
how can you assess what is right for you, for your portfolio out of this huge universe of different assets and businesses? Um, there are different approaches to this. I like thinking or applying the lens of thematic investing, or basically thinking about the themes or trends overall that we are observing now, not necessarily in financial markets, that are here to stay. Particularly important for private markets because, again, if I invest in a business such as Advara Hardcare, it's a leading uh, cardiology service provider in Australia, I know I'm going to stay within that business for the next three to five years. And when I'm selling my stake in this business in five years' time, I want to know or to be certain that there will be still strong demand for this type of business, for those services. So the themes that I like to think about, they do have those long-term strong tailwinds. Growing aging population, really hard to argue with this one. Digitalization, we saw this acceleration during the COVID and it will continue, it is inevitable. Growing demand for food and then climate change or energy transition. The good thing about private markets that across each of this theme, you as an investor can identify opportunities in real estate, infrastructure, private equity, etc. So it's a really good lens to think about when you select uh, your investments. Now, in terms of the examples in the portfolio, why, when I look at the peers, you know, there are some LICs that invest only in private credit, LICs that invest only in real estate, et cetera, et cetera. I really, I'm a strong believer in diversification benefits and really thinking about upside scenarios, but also the resilience of the portfolio. And maybe it's also my background, you know, I'm originally from Russia and I've seen markets and economies collapsing within a day. And um, we had some interesting discussions about the current level of inflation, which to be honest, I don't see as a high level of inflation because I went through much higher levels of inflation. Um, but really it's about thinking if market or a country like Australia is experiencing um, strong droughts and I'm investing only in agriculture. Is there anything else in my portfolio that will help me still get the right investment returns or that will help me protect my portfolio from those risks? That's really the underlying thinking about looking at diverse range of opportunities rather than going just in one. And I um, try to present here how you can also think about constructing the portfolio across those different investment themes. Now, in terms of the examples, some of them uh, you might be familiar. We talked about Sunshine Coast Airport. Retail Zoo is a private equity investment. Does anyone know Retail Zoo? Booze Juice? Booze Juice? Betty's Burgers? So Retail Zoo owns those brands. Um, it's, a, it's a buyout opportunity where private equity capital buys the majority stake in the business and continues drying, driving the growth strategy of that business. There is a huge demand for this type of businesses in Australia. Advara Hardcare similarly buy out private equity. Um, the business owns about 400 clinics across uh, the states in Australia. And the thesis is that the demand for cardiology healthcare services will continue growing in Australia. So they are developing and buying more clinics across different states. HCA Australia, that's a more recent example of the deal where we invested five million just in this business because HCA Australia is the leading provider of healthcare labor to hospitals, not just private hospitals, but also public hospitals because I know when you think about healthcare, the main bottleneck in that sector is the supply of labor. 
So HCA business, they have um, thousands of medical nurses who would then go to hospitals experiencing shortage of labor and work for them on short contracts. So it's a really good opportunity to think, if I like healthcare, I probably want to go on the supply side at the moment in order to mitigate those risks. One misconception about alternative assets is that it's all risky. It is misconception because, and this is just an example of how I construct WMA portfolio. There is a whole range of defensive strategies. Strategies where the valuations of value of the actual assets and businesses does not really change or change in a very minimal way over time. Over time, I'm talking about 10, 20 years. Most of the time, those are essential assets, so infrastructure is one of those strategies. And from the investment perspective, you'd be looking at fairly predictable, fairly stable income returns. So I, I like talking about infrastructure because really we are now, like if we see this current level of inflation as a high level of inflation, you do want to add to your portfolio a strategy that would provide protection against high inflation. Why infrastructure? Because in most of the infrastructure sectors, contractual revenues have embedded links to inflation. In other words, your income return from those strategies will go up every year in line with inflation. In fact, within our portfolio, the last financial year, it was one of the best performing asset classes, 7.5% yield. And I know because I, I can see what are the underlying assets, what it will be for the next year. Private debt, depending what private debt, so if it's not the private debt that offers you 15% return, which I can tell you, you know, downside risks are unlimited. Private debt, in, in simple terms, you know, most of the time, I'd be looking in this case in our portfolio at senior loans. So loans that basically is on the top of the capital structure. And to some extent, I look at this as an investment that even more secure than equity investment, because in the case of bankruptcy, of a business, senior loan lenders are being paid first, ahead of equity holders. You don't want to go into this scenario, but still, from the risk perspective. And why it's a good time, you know, everyone is talking about private debt from the perspective of the timing, because most of the time, those loans, they are floating loans. In other words, whatever RBA does with the interest rates, your income from this strategy will change in line. So when interest rates go up, it does offer attractive returns. 9% running yield currently from senior loan strategies. Healthcare real estate, you know, is another interesting example where it's predominantly, I see it as a link to inflation because leases are long term, 10 years plus, and they're linked to annual inflation. The most interesting and the most dynamic part of the WMA portfolio is growth strategies. They are the most interesting. They do deliver outsized returns. They also have higher risk. So not everything within alternatives is risky and complex. Some of them are pretty simple strategies backed by essential assets and essential businesses. If you do look at adding to your portfolio access return or in investment terms some alpha, private equity type of strategies are the ones. What is your expectation when you buy residential property in terms of the valuation uplift? Like let's say if you hold it for 10 years, residential property, by how much do you expect the value to change, double? In private equity, you are looking at 3.5, 4.5 times money invested 
over five to seven years. I had one recent exit within the portfolio. It's a food, uh, food related business uh, called Birch and White, Australian business that was exited at 105% premium to carrying value, delivering nearly four times money invested over five years period. So the potential for outsized returns is great. It does require more skills, more time to understand the risks, to understand the structures, et cetera, and you know, construct the portfolio that will be well diversified. Uh, but definitely worth looking at this as well. I think I'm going to leave the last slide because we, we talked quite a lot about the few examples. But hopefully, um, I triggered some interest, and um, you'd want to go back and learn more about alternative strategies, alternative asset classes. Thank you.